Welcome to the Wander Learn Podcast. I'm your host, Franz Tapon. I'm here with Gary Arndt. Uh, he's been on the show a few times. And welcome back, Gary. Thanks for having me. So, Gary, it's been, what, over a year for sure that you've been doing your Everything Everywhere daily podcast. Am I right? Yeah, I started on Janu- uh, July 1st, 2020. Okay, so yeah, just over a year. And I actually fi- took your advice because originally I was only listening to episodes that had titles that looked interesting to me. And then you said, no, Francis, you're wrong. You should just listen to everyone, even the ones that don't sound interesting, because you're going to learn something. And I took your advice, and you're right. <laughs> you should just, just do it. Just learn. So uh, thank you for that One of the whole things is, is that we live in a, a bubble, ever more so. Even though we have access to all the information in the world online, uh, we really only see things that algorithms tell us we want to see. So if... The algorithms say, oh, well, you like World War II history. It'll show you more World War II history, but it won't show you something from Roman history or Chinese history. and Or how to bake a you, cake. <laughs> yeah. And, and so the only way to really do that, and, and the, part of the reason for my podcast is to expose you to things. You remember that Donald Rumsfeld press conference from the, the Iraq the known War? The unknowns and the unknown knowns. Yes. <laughs> so... The no, no, no. My podcast is about unknown unknowns. <laughs> it's right. about I didn't even know that was a thing type experience that you can learn and, and do it in just like 10 minutes. Right. No, and it's brilliant for that. And and yeah, I actually do listen to every episode you put out and I, I congratulate you and I'm glad it's doing well. I mean, it is doing well, correct? I mean, how, how are things going? Yeah, it's, it's doing about uh, 130,000 downloads a month. Uh, it's plateaued. Uh, the last two months, but some of that may have had to do with, there was a bug with Apple, uh, under reporting, uh, downloads. And I, when they fixed it, I did notice they went back up as well as, uh, a seasonal thing. Uh, podcasts usually slow down in the summers and pick up again around September when school starts. That's weird. I mean, I, I guess I can understand why I suppose. Yeah. It's also just, you know, it's part of the nature of the medium. And it's, it's the, it's the good thing and the bad thing about it. Podcasting is the last thing in the internet that is a throwback to the way the internet used to be. How so? Now everything is run by algorithms. And one of the the frustrations I've had with say running a, a blog is that there are no blogs anymore. There are websites, but all, all it likes just, you know, uh, for travel, which is, you know, our background, uh, my travel blog used to be a blog. I started traveling and I would leave my thoughts for wherever, wherever I was for that day on my website. I would just write something pithy mm-hmm. for a headline and I wasn't doing SEO. I wasn't worrying about keyword research or anything like that. And people would come to my website every day or they, uh, they read it through RSS and, and that's what it was. And then eventually that stopped because people would fall, you expected to get stuff on Facebook or Twitter and as a result, the percentage of traffic that came from places like Google increased and increased. So people began doing more and more to appease Google. And now everything is just listicles, uh, top 15 things to do in this place. And it's all SEO driven. And uh, one of the, the best thing, you know, quotes I've heard in the last year was someone saying, if you are creating content for an algorithm, you have no audience. You may have traffic right? But you don't have readers. You really don't. You don't have anyone that knows who you are and cares what you have to say and wants to hear more about you in the future. You have people that accidentally went to your website to get the information they were looking for and then left and probably will never return. Right. But with podcasting, if someone's listening to this show, they know who you are. You're the host and they know your voice. They know they have a better idea of who you are as a person listening to you talk. Yeah. Um, and the frustrating part is, and so that's the good part. The frustrating part is that there is no algorithm. So you can't game the algorithm, which I've historically done a really good job of doing, uh, for, for things like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. But, uh, because there's no algorithm, you have to basically create something that people want to share and, oh, you know, it cause and word of mouth is slow and that's a very difficult thing to do so it, it's it's the best and, and, and worst of the internet but i think at the end of the day it's far better than 
uh, the alternative, which is having these giant companies sort of control who gets to see what. True. And speaking about giant companies that control things, I went to your fan page and I see that you're really getting into porn lately. Yeah, my fan page got <laughs> hijacked a couple days ago on Facebook and Facebook notified me. It's like, hey, just to let you know, you've lost control of your fan page. And then there is no means to contact someone or to rectify the problem. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. And I've spent a very long time going through everything that is publicly available on Facebook to solve this problem. I've started tweeting them, you know, trying to contact Facebook on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's nothing you can do. And what do you th it, it's infuriating that they literally, it's not that they don't have customer service, but they have anti-customer service where they go out of their way. It's like, you know, on, sometimes on Halloween, you go trick-or-treating and there's that one person's house where they lead, take, they turn all the lights off and they hide because they don't want to have to deal with kids at the front door. That's Facebook with customer service. <laughs> They're literally turning the lights off, closing the drapes and hiding so nobody can contact them because they don't want to pay money for it. Right. Right. Now, it is crazy. What do you think is going to happen in, let's say, 50 years or maybe even 30 years? Do you think Facebook is going to be replaced by what? Uh, a lot of uh, Facebook now skews older as a demographic. I don't know if you've seen any of the stats on that, but there's a lot of like kids in high school that simply either don't have Facebook accounts or don't use Facebook. And I also think no one trusts Facebook. I think it's one of those things of the uh, network effect gone haywire where you know, the more people in a system, the greater the value, that there's a lot of people on Facebook because they're on Facebook. And I am sp now spending most of my time on Discord, to be honest. Hmm. Uh, there are Discord communities. They're, they're smaller. You know everyone there. Um, no one's tracking you. There's no ads. So it's a much better, and, it, and it's, it's basically a throwback again to the old days of the internet where it might have been an IRC server. Uh, Discord servers were originally created for gamers to coordinate uh, their, their play. So you can do voice as well as share images and text and things like that. Um, it's like Slack if you're, if you're familiar with that, but it's, it's not necessarily for a, a business environment. And that's where I've been spending most of my time. And that's where I would prefer, uh, you know, people actually interact. The problem is everyone is so accustomed to just doing stuff on Facebook that it's hard to get them away from it. Do you have a schedule, Gary? Because you always respond quickly to my emails, and I think anybody's emails, not just me. And you respond well on social media like Facebook, for example. And I haven't tested you too much on Twitter, but... Do you have a schedule? Since there's so many different platforms out there, how do you do it? Do you say, okay, I'm going to spend half an hour on this, 15 minutes on that, or it's just kind of ad hoc? I just don't have a life. <laughs> um, I rarely check LinkedIn. That's just not a, a big deal uh -huh. to me because everything I do is basically uh, public facing. It's not a B2B thing. I don't really care about LinkedIn too much. And mm. there's also... Uh, just a lot of people on LinkedIn, everyone's a coach or they're trying mm. to sell some sort of, you know, training program. And I, I, I don't care about any of that. And um, yeah, Discord, like there's a podcasting group on Discord that's grown a lot in the last few weeks. And a lot of like a lot of big name people are hanging out there. And it's a it's just a, a far better community than anything in, in social media. I think Twitter is toxic. Uh, Facebook is just brain dead. Instagram, they've killed so much organic reach because they want people to buy ads. So their Facebook has been purposely uh, trying to kill the influencer economy because every you know if you pay a thousand dollars to an influencer, that's a thousand dollars that Facebook sees that is not going to Facebook. So they've been reducing organic reach for everyone slowly over time. And they're going to make it such that if you want to reach people, you have to buy an ad and do it through Facebook. What about Clubhouse? Yeah, that was I was doing that for a while, and Clubhouse is just a joke now. Uh, it's the same people having the same discussions over and over. 
I haven't no, I mean, participated in it, but I, I, no, I, I, you, what happened? you've missed it already. Okay. <laughs> the golden age of Clubhouse was in like February and January. It's gone. 2021. It's, okay. Yeah. I mean, and when I say it's the same people having the same discussions, I mean that in a very literal sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are people, you know, like there was this time when Twitter came out and it became a big thing. And like, then there was this rush, like, oh, if you don't get on board something early, you're going to miss it. And then Google Plus came out. There was a lot of this activity, but it wasn't because people loved Google Plus. It was because they all want to get their numbers up and, and, and do that. And that's what happened with Clubhouse. You had this group of people, and they're literally spending 12 hours a day on Clubhouse, mm-hmm. which is insane. Yeah. Because it's, it's Clubhouse is as if in a world where there was only Netflix, someone invented live TV. And they said, hey, I have this new idea. It's video, but you can only watch it if you're sitting there at the right time. Right. And that's what Clubhouse is. And the, the, yeah, so they try organizing these rooms, but quite frankly, it's, yeah, it's the same discussions over and over. The travel story that changed your life. Okay, maybe we could talk about that once. And then doing it next week and next week and next week, it's like, well, what the hell are you going to say? Mm-hmm. And that's what it's become. And people are trying to, you know, get all these followers and everything. And yeah, I, I just think that that moment has passed. And there was this talk like, oh, Clubhouse is going to kill podcasting. No, it's not. That's like saying Twitter is going to kill books. No, right. it, it's not going to happen. Now, something that you do want to make happen is getting rid of slavery in the United States or at least off the books. Tell us about your petition. Okay, so uh, I did an, an episode on uh, unratified constitutional amendments. So these were constitutional amendments that passed the first step of getting through Congress. So they had a two-thirds vote in both houses, but they did not pass the final step of three-fourths approval of the states. And there's several of these. Uh, one of them is, and, and I should also add, I, I just did an episode on the 27th Amendment. That was an unratified amendment. It was part of the original 12 uh, Bill of Rights, of which only 10 of which got passed. And uh, there was this kid who was a college student in Texas, and he got a C on a paper that he wrote about how this, it was a congressional pay raise amendment, that this was still in play and this could still (coughs) actually become ratified. And the professor gave him a C. And despite his professor, he spent 12 years getting the amendment ratified. And so the 27th Amendment, which was ratified in 1992, was first passed through Congress in 1788. Wow. So there's no time limit once it passes Congress. Right. So in 1861... Right before the Civil War. Oh, actually, during the Civil War. Well, no, it was just... It was uh, because back in the day, the president took office in March. So this would have been under James Buchanan, the last months of his presidency. Uh, Congress barely passed an amendment or, or proved an amendment called the Corwin Amendment. And the Corwin Amendment basically says, and it doesn't use the word slavery, but it uses like, uh, you know, tr- you know s- traditional state uh, things about uh, labor. And it basically says that it can never be changed by the Constitution again. So it basically, it's an amendment that says you can never change this amendment. And so it passed Congress but it never got ratified by enough states. It got ratified by five states, two of which uh, rescinded the ratification. Ohio did it in 1864, and Maryland did it in 2014. So there are three states out there that on the books still have ratified the Corwin Amendment to preserve slavery forever. Rhode Island, Kentucky, and Illinois. Um, And so I think this is the biggest no-brainer layup in history. This is a bipartisan issue. It should get unanimous support by everybody. It's it's a historical oversight. I don't think anybody advocates for this anymore. It's just something that got forgotten after the war because the 13th Amendment was passed, you know, uh, slavery was banned. But in theory, this thing is still alive. It Just like the 27th Amendment, it could still get passed. And in the 1960s, Texas actually debated uh, ratifying the Corwin Amendment during the civil rights struggle. So it's not like it's 
dead and can never come back. They, they actually you know, debated uh, authorizing it. So I think this is just something that it's kind of like cleaning up uh, some stuff that's been laying around. And it would be a simple thing that Congress could do. There's no need for debate. There's no need for a committee hearing. There's no need for spending any money. They just need to clean it up and get this off the books. Got it. So I'll put a link in the show notes so everybody else can sign this petition of yours and maybe it will work its way into the Congress. Uh, so, yeah, the petition is basically it, it's targeting the leaders of the two legislative houses in those three states, as well as the uh, majority and minority leaders in the Senate and the House of Congress. Hmm. Uh, and again, I think if, they, if, it, if you can just get to someone's attention, it doesn't even have to be one of the leadership. Um, it, it's such a no brainer thing that I can't see how anybody could object to, to doing it, especially in the environment that we're, we're living in today, that they mm-hmm. that they would be against rescinding a constitutional amendment, not a law, which not just protects, but would preserve, you know, constitutionally slavery. Right. True. Let's talk about your top few episodes that in the last year it could be the top five doesn't really matter just or whatever it pops into mind as some of the ones that you found either the most memorable or surprising or noteworthy in one way or another. Uh, what comes to mind, Gary? Oh boy. Uh, yeah, you got over 300 close episodes to, <laughs> close to got? 400 now. Yeah, exactly. Um, one that, that kind of always sticks out is the story of, uh, Joe Medicine Crow, who was the last Crow war chief. Uh, Joseph Medicine Crow uh, fought in World War II, and he's a member of the Crow Nation. And in the Crow Nation, uh, they had a title uh, called a war chief. And it wasn't a title which was given. You had to earn it, and you had to earn it in battle. And the way you traditionally earn it is that you had to do uh, four things. You had to touch an enemy during battle without killing them. That's called counting coup. You had to steal an enemy's weapon. You had to successfully lead a war party and return alive. And you had to steal a horse. Joseph Medicine Crow did all the four of those things in World War II, including the stealing a horse. Um, the first two he did, he was uh, in a village, I think, in, in Belgium. And he turned a corner at the same time another German soldier was turning a corner and they like bumped into each other and they fought on the ground and they wrestled and uh, he ended up grabbing the German soldier's rifle and uh, they kind of, the, the German soldier said something like mother and they it kind of broke up the, the hold they were in and the German soldier ran away. So he both got the counting coup part and the stealing the, the weapon part. He was a scout uh, so he was doing reconnaissance before the main units arrived. And there's a, a legend that he was the first American actually to enter German territory in the war. Uh, so he actually did lead a party uh, that he actually received the French uh, Legion of Honor uh, f- for doing this. Uh, so that was the third part. And then towards the end of the war, they were going to this place that was held by the SS, and they had 40 thoroughbred horses. And they were going to start mortaring it. And he goes to the commanding officer and he says, hey, before you do this, uh, let me go in and steal the horses. So he goes in really early in the morning before anyone gets up. He just uses a horse as a bridle. And he uh, gets on one of the horses, opens up the gate, and herds them all out. And he, he got the stealing an enemy horse thing. And when he came back to Montana... And he was talking to the elders about his war exploits. He didn't even realize it. They said, you, you did everything for the title of a war chief. You've, you've earned the title of war chief. And so he is the last, uh, not only member of the Crow Nation, but I think any uh, Plains Indian to have achieved it. And he did it in World War II. Amazing. And speaking about the last person in World War II, there's also the story of, I think, the last person to die in World War I, maybe, or was it World War II? That guy who got out of the trench, and I think it was World War I, he got out of the trench and just ran basically on a suicide mission and 
the Germans, I guess, didn't want to shoot him, but they eventually had to. And the armistice or the surrender officially was going to happen at noon, and he ran at like 11.59. <laughs> you can tell the story better than I can. Yeah, so uh, it was Sergeant Henry Gunther. And mm. when the, so the, the armistice was signed at, I want to say, around 6 a.m. in the morning. And at 11 is when everything was going to end. And you'd think that when the word gets out, hey, everyone, the war is going to end at 11, that you would basically just bide your time and do nothing and wait for 11, right? Which is what most people did, actually. But uh, there were a lot, especially the Americans, who didn't do that. They kept fighting till the very end because they assumed that the armistice would probably fall apart. Oh. And they didn't want to give up any territory. So like the American artillery units literally timed it so that they fired their last shot such that it would land just before the stroke of 11. And a lot of the artillery units also, they didn't want to have to deal with all of the uh, munitions that were sitting there. So they just fired everything off so they didn't have to, to deal with inventory and, and, and taking it back or anything. And in the case of, of Henry Gunther, um, basically, yeah, they, they were pinned down by some Germans with a machine gun in this tiny village in France. They knew they just had to wait till 11. The Germans knew that they had to wait till 11. And for whatever reason, he gets up and starts charging. And the guys in his unit say, stop, stop, go back. The Germans are shouting, stop, stop, go back. And he's attacking the German position and, and they fire, uh, killing him instantly. And if he had, uh, it's, it's really unknown. Um, he was demoted. He was a sergeant. He was demoted back to being a private. And some people think that it may have been his chance to redeem himself. Uh, he lost his fiance over it back home. So maybe it was depression and he was trying to suicide himself. And this was the last opportunity to do it. Nobody knows. What's your most downloaded episode? I don't know. Well, okay. Uh, it may have been one about... Uh, the seven people that run the internet. Um, so I don't, I don't remember if I listened to that particular one. I it, that has to do with the domain name system. Oh yeah. No, the way the yeah. domain name system, it's, it's hierarchical. And at the end of it, there's like, you know, a single set of servers that control everything. And there's this elaborate system where seven people have keys where they could reboot this ultimate last server if they actually needed to, and they have a, basically a ceremony that takes place uh, twice a year where they generate these keys and they have witnesses uh, to, to signify it and it's recorded and the seven people are from all over the world and it's a thing that they do. Um, and if, you know, it, it should be corrupted, that's, that's what they would do to, uh, to fix it. And I think that got passed around in some, some, some technology circles uh, every so often, I'll get a, an episode that's passed around like that, and it'll get a spike in traffic. Right. I think another one had to do with a horse. I can't remember what that was. Uh, and a real early one that I had that had a spike was uh, the world's most dominant athlete. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and we talked no, I about use the that. Word, I mm-hmm. use the word dominant, uh, you know, I, I'm very picky about it, and it's the world's greatest horseshoe pitcher. That's right. And yeah. he basically has won everything, almost everything, for the last 25 years. Well, more than that, for 30 years. Because he won his first world championship in 1989. Then he won champ- he's won 24 championships. So he's won them in the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s. And then last year's the world championship was canceled. But he's still the world's greatest horseshoe pitcher and was expected to win. So if he wins this year, and I, I actually need to follow up on it. They may have done it. Um, he would have won a world championship in five different decades. That's amazing. Yeah. And it's horseshoe pitching. So he could, he could be a great horseshoe pitcher, you know, into his sixties. It's, it's not like it's, you know, uh, you know, football or something. What do you think about the fact that certain Olympians can get a lot more medals than others? For example, I just heard that a Cuban Greco Roman wrestler won the last four gold medals. So that's 16 years, or actually now, uh, because we skipped a year, so it's actually 17 years of gold medals. So basically the maximum 
that you could really get. And then you got Michael Phelps, who's got over 22. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, so obviously swimming and gymnastics are the two areas where you can earn multiple medals. And if you look at the all-time, I I just did an episode on this for like the Olympic uh, greatest Olympian. Um, But I should say this about Michael Phelps. He's also more than doubled the next closest medal count for anyone in swimming. So even though swimming is inflated, he what he did in swimming was far greater by a, a wide margin than what anyone else has ever done in swimming. So yeah, in swimming, it's like, okay, swim this distance. Now do it this way. Now do it this way. You know, so there's four different strokes. Okay, now you did 50. Now you do 100. Now you do 200. Okay, now we're going to do it with four of your buddies. Now we're going to do it with four of your buddies, but you're all going to switch swim different strokes. And so they just mix and match it so much that uh, it, it's easy. And there's, you know, there are some sports I think that could do more medals. Archery is a good one. Archery only has men's, women's, and then they have the uh, men's, women's team, and then they have a mixed team. And that's it. They don't do different distances. They don't do recurve versus compound bows, which is something they may do in the future. So one of the biggest Olympic stories this year was a, uh, uh, a woman. South Korea is great at archery. Don't know why. Um, but she basically had a perfect uh, Olympics. She won the individual gold medal, setting an Olympic record. She won the women's team medal, setting an Olympic record. And then she won the mixed team uh, event, setting an Olympic record. So she, she literally could not have done any better. Her name is An San. And uh, I'm thinking of actually doing an episode, like a recap of the Olympics for all the stories that you didn't hear. Because there's a lot of these that kind of get overlooked because you only, like in the U.S., we only hear about stuff where the Americans were involved. Right. Like I was wondering who won the 100-meter dash this year, only to find out, oh, they already did it, and the guy who won was Italian. Right. And it wasn't, you know, a Jamaican or an American. Right. It was an Italian. Granted, he was—he has an American father, but um, he's lived his whole life in Italy. He knows, you know, speaks, speaks absolutely fluent Italian. That's his first language. And uh, I didn't hear about it because of this. And there's there's other things like that as well. Um, the, the guy you mentioned in Greco-Roman, there's been a few people that have won gold medals at four different Olympics. Right. Um, if the women's basketball team wins a gold medal this year, both Sue Bird and Diana Taurasi will have won gold medals at five Olympics. Wow. And that's only been done by one other person, Steve Redgrave, who is a rower from Britain. Wow. Now, here's the great thing. Diana Taurasi is 39. And the next Olympics is three years away, not four years away. Mm. So she would be 42, which is very possible to, to be playing at a competitive level, especially if you want a seasoned leader on your team. She could become the first person in history to win a gold medal in six different Olympics if she's on the team in Paris in 2024. And I kind of hope she is just because. And if <laughs> because she wins, I love and if their team wins. Well, yeah. I mean, but the Amer- I mean, the American women in, in basketball are, I think, very clearly the, the best team in the world. And, and I can say that more than I can about the men. Um, the men won the gold medal this year, but I think it's very plausible that there are uh european teams out there that could uh beat them because uh, there's a lot of really good you know the last three nba's uh, uh mvps in the nba came from europe why by the way does the american team not sport its best nba players often is it because they're afraid of injury or they're just not compensated yeah. enough injury that that's one of the big things i mean you do get a if you start uh, kevin durant was on the team this year lebron james has been on it in the past but it's not considered to be, uh, yeah, a thing, you know. That's in weird. soccer, I mean, like uh, if I have a, if I'm an NBA player and I have a chance to get a gold medal in the Olympics, I'd be like, yeah, sign me up. I don't care if I'm on the bench. I I don't know. I it's I I do think it's injury. I, the the NBA is never really strongly behind it. Um, like Giannis Akiatempo, who's I think the best player in the NBA right now is with the Bucks. He just won an NBA title, uh, was not on the Greece team. And he's from Greece and he probably should have been. Right. Um, but I can, that I can understand a little bit more just because Greece has no hope in hell in winning a gold medal or even any medal. And so therefore, yeah, I they understand. could. If he was on the team, they absolutely could be in medal contention. 
Okay. All right. I trust you. Maybe on that maybe, one. maybe not a gold medal, but I think they absolutely Giannis and his brothers, he has like four different basketball playing brothers. They could make up the Greek team. <laughs> and and they would I'm I'm not even joking because they all play either professional or, you know, highly competitive basketball. Yeah, I I, I think you know, maybe not a gold, but certainly a silver or a bronze is, is not out of the question at all. all and right. Greece well, actually okay. does have a good pro league, one of the best in Europe. Okay. I'd say along with Spain. Okay. Okay. So I'll take that one back. But but you understand my point is if you come from a country, I don't know, like Iceland, and you happen to play on the NBA, but Iceland doesn't have a chance, why would I join the national team? Because I'm just basically having a chance of getting injured. It doesn't make any Slovenia sense. was in the semifinals. Um, right. But Slovenia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but but S- Serbia, Germany, Russia, France, Spain, all have really Decent good. Teams. But that's where most of the, the, the foreign NBA players come from. Right. Right. Um, Croatia. And, they had, they had sometimes too. Yeah. And, um, well, China had Yao Ming, but I, I, right. I don't think there's been a lot of players from China. And there are uh, players from various countries in Africa as well. Um, mm. Many of them, however, are coming to school for the U.S. They're playing college, and they learn a lot of basketball outside of their native country. So they mm. may play for a national team, but you know, I think it's kind of hit or miss with what kind of team they can put together. Right. Interesting. Uh, what about your travel, uh, Gary? I know you've kind of put things aside not necessarily because you wanted to, but also because your podcast, but mainly because of COVID. Um, what are your plans for 2022? I want to run a tour uh, for my for my listeners. So that's something I've planned. One of the things I'm going to do is I've kind of been rethinking about how to do a tour because a lot of the tours I've done in the past, a group tour, it's like you start in this city, you spend a day or two there, then you go to the next city, then you go to the next city, then you go to the next city. And as I, you know, one of the, the common themes of a lot of my episodes has been stuff about ancient Rome, just because I think there's a lot of things about it that a lot of people don't realize. And there's a lot of things about the world today, which can trace its origins back to Rome and we don't realize it. And I, I thought about like, there's so much stuff in Rome itself that you could easily spend a week there easily, maybe 10 days. Mm-hmm. I thought, well, what if we just did like a, a, a one room tour? where you check into your hotel and you just stay there because your average tourist to Italy is, or to Rome is going to go to the forum and the Colosseum. They're going to go to the Vatican. They'll see the Trevi fountain and that's it. You know, maybe there's a few other things and then they move on somewhere else, but there's so much more that's there that people don't know about. Like there's underneath the altar of the Vatican is the Vatican necropolis. Not the grotto where a bunch of popes are buried. This is the ancient Roman cemetery, which is why the Vatican is built where it is. Uh, And it's where St. Peter was believed to have been buried, and that's why they built the church there. Uh, The Emperor Constantine built it. And you can actually go down there. They take small groups. You can't do photography. Uh, I think they take as most eight people. But that's something that I think would be really cool to do. Nero's palace uh, was the largest building in antiquity, probably. Um, it was this enormous thing. It was called the, the Domus Aureus, which is the uh, golden house. And part of it's still there. And you can go and you can see the dining room and it was buried. And so a lot of the original artwork is still there, untouched. Hadrian's Villa, just outside of Rome, I've been there. Uh, just an absolutely amazing place. Hardly anyone visits. Same with the Fountains of Tivoli. Eh, more people visit that. If you go the other direction to Ostia, which is the Roman, uh, the, the former port city of Rome, it's actually two kilometers from the sea now because the river silted it in over 2,000 years. But uh, that's like going to Pompeii. It's a very well-preserved city. And again, people, people don't bother to go there. And then there's tons of things in the city itself that are smaller things, maybe a monument, a gate, an arch, um, uh, a catacomb, that, you know, because there's so many different layers of history. It's not all just ancient Roman history, but you also have, uh, you know, stuff dealing with, with Christianity, the Renaissance, and and even, you know, early 20th, late 19th century stuff, that this stuff is often forgotten. And I think there's a very interesting tour that could be done just focusing on one city. So I'm looking at Rome first, 
And then maybe I think that it could also be done in a place like Istanbul uh, in Jerusalem, because that's another place where there's just so much history right. that you can't really see a lot of it in, you know, two days. Right. Speaking about seeing a lot, you were in Minneapolis when the George Floyd riots were going on, and you left, and now you're in Wisconsin, your home state. A good move, might I add. Exactly. So I was going to um, ask you, like, what is the situation since you're not far from and you still have contacts in Minneapolis? What is life like? Because you don't hear much about George Floyd anymore and and, and life in Minneapolis ever since things kind of died down and there was a settlement. Uh, the crime rate has dramatically spiked. Murders have gone up. Carjackings have gone up dramatically. Um, I've talked to some people who lived in my neighborhood a few months ago, <clears throat> and basically nothing, nothing's been fixed. Very little has been done. Everything is still boarded up, they said. Um, there, there's been a lot of issues with um, getting insurance approved. A lot of these people that said, you know, it's okay to riot and burn everything down because everyone has insurance. Spoiler, no, they don't. And just because they have it, it doesn't mean it covers it. And a lot of the people that did have insurance, uh, they're collecting their policy and they're just leaving. They're, they're not rebuilding. No one wants to rebuild in, in that neighborhood anymore. And the, the, the thing that, the straw that broke the camel's back for me was when I heard this councilwoman from Minneapolis give an interview to CNN where she basically said that, you know, uh, police protection is a privilege. And I was like, I'm out. No one, no one voted on that. That was never an issue in any election. And, uh, and pretty much everywhere defund the police was an issue. It had, people are backtracking now because crime has, has exploded in cities all over the United States. And, uh, this is, you know, especially among Af African Americans, because they're the primary victims of it. Uh, they've been deeply concerned. And this whole defund the police thing, I think, has just gone absolutely nowhere. You're seeing retirements and uh, people leaving police forces everywhere, leaving them shorthanded. And you're having a lot of serious problems in a lot of major cities in America. And I've, I'm living in a rural area right now. 100 yards from me, there is a cornfield. Uh and I'm, I've it really changed my my opinion on a lot of things the last year. One of which is, you know, I had always lived in, in major cities for for most of my life. Uh, do I need to do that? Like, what is the the benefit now, especially with the pandemic? And we're so used to doing video conferencing and things like that. That uh, are you are you familiar with Starlink? Yeah. Oh, I I have become a huge huge fan of Starlink. I'm following it religiously and what they're doing. And for those that don't know what it is, it's the SpaceX Elon Musk program. They have over, I think they have close to 1500 satellites in orbit now, and they're providing high speed broadband, low latency internet everywhere on earth. And literally in the middle of nowhere, you can do this. And this isn't a theoretical thing. There are almost 100,000 people currently using it. And in all the forums I'm on, on Reddit or Facebook, that talk about Starlink, every day, it's someone gets it installed and their life has changed. That they went from less than a megabit connection from some crappy rural ISP to now having broadband and being able to join the rest of the world. Now, if you can have this anywhere, and you can get Amazon deliveries from anywhere, and I can get, um, I just installed an app on my Apple TV for the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, there are several apps now that do performances by uh, various symphonies around the world. There's even one that does uh, videos of Broadway productions that you can sign up for. So what really is the benefit to living in a city at this point? Now, it used to be that if you wanted a top job in publishing or finance or whatever, you had to live in New York. You just had to. There was no, even three years ago, that was probably the case. But a lot of finance people have left New York in the last year. Uh, a lot of them have gone to Miami because it's all done online anyhow, right? Um, and what people are realizing, and a lot of the big tech com companies are realizing this, that they, are, they were able to keep up their levels of productivity with people working at home, and then it doesn't matter where home is anymore. 
And with Starlink, Starlink has the potential to be completely one of the most revolutionary things that's happening right now. And it's revolutionary, but most people, it won't affect them directly because it's not for people in cities. If you have fiber, you know, Starlink isn't for you. But the fact that you're going to be able to put this, uh, they're, and they're coming out with a mobile version. So you'll be able to put this on a camper, a semi, a boat, a plane. So that means you can live anywhere. You can get stuff shipped to you anywhere. You can work from anywhere. Um, it, it's also going to change things like... Uh, travel. So right now, if you want to go to Europe, you pretty much have to fly. In the olden days, you would take a ship. They're really, Cunard does have a transatlantic service, but it's really, you do it for the experience and you bring a gown and a tuxedo and you pretend it's the Titanic and that stuff. And they go slower than necessary so they can actually milk another day or two out of it so you can spend time, you know, drinking. But what if it would, instead of having something fancy, it was just a carnival type ship and, you know, you can do a week-long cruise for, like, 700 bucks. You know, there are really cheap cruises out there. Well, instead of just bouncing around the Caribbean, going to Senior Frogs or whatever in different ports, what if it just took you to London? A four-day trip, New York to London. Um, you would eat better than you would on a plane. You would sleep better than you would on a plane. You could get up and walk around. You wouldn't be jet-lagged when you arrive. You just uh, change your schedule one day, one hour every day. Um, and you could probably do so at the same price of a ticket, maybe even cheaper, and you could have high-speed internet on board and stay in touch and do work and be productive while you're doing it. That lack of productivity is what's stopping people from doing something like that now, right? You don't want to take four days off of work to make a trip to Europe. Uh, I would do it, but I have more time than most people because I just travel, but I think it could revolutionize that. It could revolutionize, you know, all the go-go wireless internet stuff in airplanes, that'll be gone. This is all moving to Starlink, absolutely, especially for domestic flights. Um, so it's going to, yeah, it's really going to change things. And it's also going to change. I'm not saying New York's going to become a ghost town, but it, it it's going to change how we view things. And, and, you know, you live in San Francisco, and I know San Francisco's been having a lot of problems uh, with crime, homelessness. And, and other issues. And at, at some point, a lot of people are just going to say, is it really worth paying a premium for this when right. I can have most of the benefits? Now, certainly you won't have restaurants. Uh, that That's, you know, one thing you're obviously not going to have and uh, nightlife and, and things like that. But a lot of it you're going to be able to have from anywhere. And, and the corollary to that isn't just living out in the woods. It's going to be people, uh, you know, we were very early on the digital nomad wagon. And it's become kind of a, a thing now. Right. And now you see countries like Barbados and Estonia. I think Georgia recently did it. who are now offering these digital nomad visas. Uh, you're going to see a lot more people that are working overseas. And, and that, that's actually the next travel I do is probably going to be in that form. I'm probably just going to go somewhere and live for a while rather than um, travel like I used to, where I was pretty busy going from place to place. I may just get an apartment somewhere for six months so I can, you know, work on the podcast. How much is Starlink? Is it 75 bucks a month or something? I think? Uh, it's $99 a month and $500 up front for the dish. Got it. Okay. And the dish is a, um, it's not a regular set curved satellite dish. Uh, it, that, that's not how it works where you point it at one part in the sky. It's actually an active, so it's, it's a technology that really has never been commercially done before uh where it will so it's con these, these satellites are in low earth orbit so they're constantly moving so it's constantly having to track different satellites interesting so it actually moves no the dish doesn't move it's electronically uh uh changing where it gets the signal from oh i see so, but it's still fixed in a certain point yeah okay there is a small motor on the dish so what you do is you just pick a spot that has, that has little obstruction like the top of your house and then it will just automatically orientate itself to the right spot and stop. Okay. But and this is the first version of it. And mm -hmm. already I've, I've, I think Elon Musk had a tweet that they brought their price to manufacture. It was originally like $2,000. I think they got it down to a thousand dollars and they're trying to get it down to uh, a few hundred because they're taking a loss on it. Mm -hmm. And are you on a waiting list to get it? 
given that you're in a rural place? Uh, no, because I'm not as far out of a rural, I'm not as much in a rural area as uh, you probably need to be. I, I think I probably could get it, but uh, we get cable here. I mean, I, I'm, I'm next to a cornfield, but I'm also 15 minutes away from an Amazon distribution center. Nice. So I'm like in an exurb, Got it. not a suburb. For some reason, I'm blanking out on the name of the author of Vagabonding. God. Ralph Potts. Thank you. He uh, reminds me of you in a bit because he's also playing this arbitrage, as he calls it, of being in a rural place. He's from Kansas. You're in Wisconsin. And you can just live very inexpensively there and yet have all the benefits that you would have if you were in New York or San Francisco. Well, you know, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is going to movies. Well, all the movies are streaming now. Right. Like on the weekend, the, the, the time they come out. And they're streaming for a lot less than it costs to go to a movie. And I, if you have a uh, any new television now, they're cheap and they're glorious. And you can get a gigantic one for very little money. And it's, it's a fine viewing experience. And I think, quite frankly, they're only going to get bigger and better over time. I would not be surprised within 10 years if uh, the average household doesn't at least have an 80-inch screen, possibly going up to 100, and it's simply the wall. And it's, it's kind of an experience like that. And there is something that changes when you have an enormous screen, that it becomes far more immersive. So watching something that's live like if let's say you're watching a you know, the the uh they filmed Hamilton and then they released it on Disney Plus to see a Broadway show a stage production like that uh actually works pretty well I think as well as sporting events and and other things yeah um so so we'll see I think that's kind of this revolution going on and I'm a I've become a big fan of uh SpaceX because what they're doing is real they've made a they've really done something in reducing the cost of getting stuff into orbit right and that's not an insignificant thing they've reduced it so much that no one else can really compete that when do you and, think and like when do you think that we're going to land on mars human beings oh i don't know there's a lot that goes into that other than i mean to be fair uh the biggest challenge is cheaply getting into earth orbit because that's that's the most energy getting from earth orbit to mars requires less energy than getting from the ground into orbit so getting out of the gravity well right um and they're they actually just put the first uh the the, the spacex spaceship on top of its booster which is actually bigger than a saturn V. they just did it yesterday and the, the scale of it is just crazy. And But they haven't, the, the, this new space uh, starship, I should say, um, they haven't launched it into orbit yet. But that will even be more revolutionary than what they've done. And the reason is, is because it's a two-stage, 100% recyclable system. So like the space shuttle was supposed to be a reusable system. In fact, it wasn't. Uh, the big orange thing in the middle got burned up the two solid rocket boosters basically had to be rebuilt from scratch every time and then the shuttle which is an insanely expensive and a complicated uh vehicle had to basically be gone over from start to finish every time it was launched especially after the uh, challenger disaster and so uh it, it wasn't really reusable it was extremely expensive whereas the uh the the starship Basically, the the booster and the actual orbiting unit uh, will be able to be reused from scratch, and their turnaround time should be, in theory, could be done in as little as a week, not you know twice a year. Uh, but do you that, think that? But do you think that human beings will land on Mars this decade? No. Okay. Because there's too much that goes into that. Even if we can get into orbit cheaply and even if we can send stuff to mars cheaply the issue of keeping humans alive we've never you know we've only had uh 18 people i mean it's 21 that we've uh yeah because of apollo 10 and but we've sent very few people beyond uh the van allen belt of earth so so like to the moon either to orbit or land on it 
Uh, and the radiation you get when you're in interplanetary space is much higher than what you get when you're in low Earth orbit where the shuttle and the, the space station normally are. So there are issues that are going to have to be overcome in terms of uh, shielding, in terms of keeping people alive. Um, lots of that stuff has to be done. But the first step to any of that is reducing the cost of getting stuff to orbit. Right. And that is where these enormous strides have taken place. You know, I've often, as a thought experiment, let's say in a million years we knew that the Earth was going to be destroyed. And not even a million years, let's say a thousand years. And so sorry, so what do we do? We need to move humanity off the Earth. What do we do? And the temptation is, okay, let's, let's build a, a, a ship. And the answer is no, you don't build a ship. You do nothing. You just get to figure out a way to get to orbit cheaply. Because the next generation is going to have, you know, once we've solved that problem, the next generation can work on everything else. And there was a great problem in computer science that I recall, um, it was basically you have this very complex, uh, you know, cryptography key you need to crack, and it would take basically 20 years worth of computer time. And so you're given 20 years to crack it. What do you do? And what, how, what's your solution to the problem? And some people, it's like, well, okay, we build a supercomputer, we do this and this, uh, you know, we create a distributed system. Yet the, the answer that achieved it in the required time uh, with the least amount of money was do nothing for 18 years, let Moore's law catch up, and then use the new computers to solve it quickly. And that's basically the approach you need to take to space, I think. It's the, you need to let to technology catch up, and then in 10 years, you worry about 20 years, you worry about going to Mars or something. All right, so 2030s is what you're saying. I agree with you, it's a big challenge. It, it's it's bigger than I think a lot of people uh, make it out. And, and here's mm -hmm. the other thing. We're going to have to go to the moon first because I think going directly from Earth orbit to Mars is probably not a good idea. You're going to probably want to do it on the moon because on the moon you can, uh, there's, there's stuff there. There's stuff mm -hmm. that we can use, water and oxygen that we can use to process, to create fuel. And it's going to be a lot easier taking that fuel from the moon than it is from Earth orbit. All right. Have but... you have you watched the series uh, for all mankind on Apple Plus? No, I don't have you Apple Plus. Sh oh well, maybe you could find ways around it. But um, I I was hesitant doing it at first, but it's an alternate history, and the one thing that was different in this this historical line uh, is that the Russians made it to the moon before America did. Oh, that yeah, was I the th one this. thing that was different, mm -hmm. and then it set off a chain reaction where. Nixon was only president for one term. Uh, his second term was Teddy Kennedy was president, but then he got caught in a sex scandal and he was a one-term president. Reagan was elected in 76, not 80. Um, we created a base on the moon. We never stopped the Apollo program, basically. And so all the, so the, the, the uh, space race basically gets extended into the 80s because uh, we, the Russians beat us to the moon. And it's a real fascinating... And so the first se uh, series was basically the 60s, and then uh, the 60s and early 70s. Uh, the second season was the 80s, and then the teaser for the third season is, uh, was just the end of the last episode of the last season was a footprint on the moon. But you don't know if it's a Soviet footprint or an American footprint, or even if the Soviet Union still exists, because there's certain parallels, like they'll throw in something like a, a TV broadcast, and it shows Senator Jimmy Carter from Georgia hmm. uh, saying something. So there's things in that timeline that are a little, a little different. But All right. Um, they got to the moon in the 90s there, or in the, in, to Mars. Oh, really? Okay. Because Musk said, Elon Musk says that he's going to get to Mars in the 20s, in 2020s. No. But of course, he, he blusters quite a bit. And I mean, it could be a one-way trip, but, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that I'm a real fan of what he's doing because he's putting his money where his mouth is and he's making substance, you know, even if Tesla doesn't make it as a car company, they've done a lot in terms of advancing electric vehicles, oh, right? Absolutely. They've revolutionized and, and so, it. And so if you look at what Ford and GM and every other major car company is doing, they're now basically at a point where within 10 years, they'll probably be selling a majority electric vehicles. Right. Um, what do you, like his Hyperloop thing, 
that never happened. That that that's never that was. But what did come of that was the Boring Company, and basically it's a company that's just doing one very simple thing, making it cheaper to dig holes in the ground, and cheaply and affordably digging holes in the ground uh, is it's a, it's an expensive thing, and if we can lower the cost on it by a factor of ten, which they're working on. It, it radically changes what we can do in terms of public transportation, building tunnels for cars, burying electrical wires, which has been causing a lot of the fires in California over the last several years, a lot of those high voltage wires. So it's again, it's a simple thing, but there's a lot of uh, changes to it. And the, the other thing that I think is really good is a lot of the effort that's going right now into fourth generation nuclear power. Uh, I, I really am a strong believer in nuclear power. I don't, I, I'm, I'm not against wind and solar, but they can't cover all the, the energy uh, that we need, especially if we move all of our vehicles to electrical, which will increase, you know, uh, energy, uh, electrical consumption has been very flat the last several decades in the U.S. Uh, there's been an increase in kind of usage and demand, but we've also had a corresponding decrease in uh, efficiency, or there's been improvements in efficiency. So total usage has been rather flat. But if all of our vehicles go from internal combustion engines to electric, we are going to see a significant increase in electricity. And uh, solar is just not going to cut it, especially when you know it doesn't work half the day. And everyone talks about how cheap solar is, and that's true. The price of solar has gone down, but that solar does not include storage. And if you need to include storage, that changes everything. So having a baseline um, amount of production, which is currently coming primarily from gas and, and less and less from coal, uh, if we can shift that to nuclear, which is already about 20% of our electrical production in the US and 75% in France. Right. Um, and these new facilities are built inherently safe. So if you literally cut the power, walked away, did nothing, they couldn't melt down, they couldn't overheat. And, uh, you know, and if you even move to something like thorium, thorium, you can't even produce uh, materials that can be used for nuclear weapons. So you don't even have the proliferation problem. Plus, it can, you know, a liquid th uh, thorium reactor can burn, basically produces no waste. It's, it's, it solves so many of the problems. Uh, you, ha so you haven't done an another... episode yet on fusion, I don't think. That's because fusion fusion is a lot like Brazil. Brazil is going to be the country of the future, and it always it always, it will, always be. will be. Hey, wait, that, and, that, you said that about Bitcoin. You're, it's going to be the yeah. currency of the future. <laughs> and the same is true with fusion. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the power source of the future and always will be. Right. Um, you know, it's there, always there's 20 years away. It's always 20 years away. <laughs> I think the immediate, you know, and, 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 if we could do it, great. But these facilities that they're building right now for these fusion tests are really expensive. If you think fission, you know, is expensive, fusion is even more expensive. And there are a lot of technical hurdles that need to be overcome. And assuming that we can overcome them, you're still looking at 20 years before it could make a significant dent into our power consumption, whereas nuclear is something that we can do today. And uh, the other big thing in nuclear is, you know, modular technology. Right now, we got to build this great big facility. And, and you know, the, the nuclear plants, most of them in the world and in all of them in the U.S. are called light water nuclear reactors. And, you know, they have those big cooling towers that are kind of reminiscent of a nuclear plant. And that's, uh, we need water. And these small modular reactors don't need all that water. So you can literally build them anywhere and you can build them on an assembly line and just ship them in and plug them in like batteries. Uh, and you can have smaller reactors for more remote places. You can uh, mix and match. And again, they can build inherently safe ones. This is this is way off track, but uh, I, I, I'm going to do one on nuclear power and nuclear waste uh, at some point in the future, an episode on it, mm -hmm. because it's an area that I think the media has really... Science coverage in the media is bad generally, but for nuclear power, it's been horrible because there are things that people believe about nuclear energy that are just simply not true. They're just not. Right. Um, and a lot of people are scared of it when they, they shouldn't be. Kind of like vaccines. <laughs> yeah. I. <laughs> it's just like I was, I was arguing with a friend of mine and she was just saying, you know, 
COVID is all about <laughs> fear and fear and fear. I'm like, yeah, you're right. It's all about fear. It's true. And so is your fear about vaccines because she's very much afraid of vaccines. So I'm like, neither one of them, in my opinion, are that scary. But, uh, <laughs> but well, yeah, I'm, I mean, of, I'm of two minds of this. I think the anti-vax stuff is ridiculous. At the same time, I do believe that the media does uh, a lot of fear mongering around it. Of course. And if you if if you look at the ratings for all the major uh, cable news networks, they they crashed this year because they the two big things that drove people to watch was COVID and Trump. Yeah. And there's without Trump and without COVID, and that's why this Delta variant. They're talking. You, I mean, you'll notice the language has shifted. It's yeah. gone from deaths to cases. Right. And but also, if you they look talk at, about they also use the word a word dangerous a lot. They don't say deadly. They say dangerous. Right. So if you look at hospitalizations and deaths, it, it hasn't moved up all that much. Mm -mm. And that's and that's good. Right. Right. So, I mean, that's one of the benefits of the vaccine is that even if you get it, it becomes like getting the flu or, or a cold. Right. It's not it's not a deadly thing. But I think and I think Delta doesn't is not even dealt as deadly as it as for those who are unvaccinated. I think that it's not as deadly as the original COVID. No, I think it just spreads faster. And there usually right. is a trade off between how communicable it is and how deadly it is. Okay. Uh, right. Think of Ebola, right? right. Ebola is yeah. really deadly. But if, if, if a virus kills everyone real quick, it can't spread. Right. So, yeah, there's there's this trade off. So, um, yeah, I, I always feel like, you know, every, there's always a desire for everyone to have one narrative or another. And, and it's usually depending on which side you're on. And I always feel like it's a two front war because, yeah, I can recognize someone says, yeah, that other side, they're full of shit. I'm like, you're right. They are full of shit. But this is also full of shit on your side. And there's often like they just ignore it or they're unwilling to address it. And it's yeah, it's very frustrating because I really do believe that we have two sides of our political spectrum that are equally crazy right now for very different reasons. On one side, it's conspiracy theories and a cult of personality. And on the other side, it's this hyper woke uh, <laughs> quasi religion where people are trying to always kind of outdo each other in showing how virtuous they are right. by purging and canceling people. Right. And that's, that's just as ridiculous. And I really don't believe returning to racial segregation <laughs> it's a good idea <laughs> that that's right. not going to help anything. And mm -hmm. it, if, if you had, if someone had told you five or 10 years ago, Hey, there's going to be a movement in this country for increased segregation. And it's going to come from the left. <laughs> right. You wouldn't have, I mean, it, that doesn't even make sense. And yet that's <laughs> kind of what's happening. And right. it's, it's just, it's nuts. It's so true. I, I really think that there's a, a, I think that if there was a, a a notable group of people, so you're talking about a couple of people in Congress from from for, who are Republicans and some who are Democrats, talking like the Joe Manchins, the Liz Cheneys, or whatever, if they created a new party that was in the center, there's a lot of people who voted for Trump who held their nose because they just couldn't bring themselves to vote for a Democrat, and there's a lot of people who voted for Hillary and Biden because they could never bring themselves to vote for a Republican. They've been, you know, on one side their whole life, and they just can't do that. But they could maybe bring themselves to vote for some The Whig new... Party. The Whig Party. You did an episode about the Whig Party. Yeah. Maybe I don't Whig... know if the Whig Party would be a great name for it. Uh, and, and there was an attempt at a revival of the Whig Party in uh, right. 2008. Right. You mentioned that. And they that. won one office in Philadelphia. Uh, but I, I think that it could it could do well, especially if they if you took people that were currently in office and you got like one or two dozen of them. So that way it doesn't look like, you know, the libertarians or the greens. They don't look like a fringe party. They're legit mm -hmm. with legit people um, that, that they could do well. And if you look at the past, you know, it's not uncommon if you go back in history. It wasn't always just Republicans and Democrats. Sometimes mm -hmm. you had three or four people earning electoral votes. And I, I don't see any reason why that couldn't happen again. And even if they didn't win the presidency or win a majority in Congress, they could still, if they, if it, if they threaten the other two parties, it will force them to kind of come back a little bit from the extremes where they're at. True. Uh, one more, a couple more things before I, uh, we close up. One thing is that 
Do you ever get emails? I imagine you do when you when people feel that you've made an error. And I don't think you've ever put out an episode that says errata. You know, like these are the you know summaries of the things I got wrong or I facts I, I got off. I, I I have never gotten an email, not one. I expected that when I started the show because I do enough of these that, and I'm not an expert on most of these subjects, right? So I'm doing a right. very high level sure. overview about things. So there's going to be someone who's going to actually be an expert and know more about me than one of these topics. And they would call me out on it. The only time it ever happened was I have a friend who has a PhD in mathematics and I did an episode on why there are some infinities larger than other infinities. I remember that. And he said, I really liked it. It was a good explanation. And he had one technical quibble that what I called Aleph one was actually uh, Beth one. Um, and that was it. But overall, he said he liked it because it was a, a challenging uh, concept to try to explain to normal people, even though there's no you know advanced mathematics involved. It's just an mm -hmm. idea. Uh, that, but that, that, that's really it. And there are a couple things where I've, I like, I accidentally said, I was talking about how Rutherford B. Hayes was really popular in Paraguay and I accidentally said Portugal. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I've done, I've had things like that where I just screwed up, but. Right, right. Uh, okay. So nothing, nothing major. So that's why I haven't seen a, an errata episode where you list like, here are the two, three things that were wrong. I, I'd be happy to do it, actually. Yeah, uh, sure. You if know, you got, but you, if you haven't, if nobody's called you out on, and somebody will at some point. Then great, you can just accumulate those up. But that's great. What and else? I've also, oh, I, I could, I could also see it where it's not just a matter of an error, but uh, interpretation. So well, that's there's one, totally different. That's totally. There's different. one camp that believes X, and there's another camp that believes yeah. Y. Yeah. Okay. And fine. it could be that in the process of doing research, I didn't know about Y. Right. Or whatever. Right. But that's different to me yeah, than a that, factual. Like if you said the World War Two ended in eight, uh, 1925, then, you know, that's just factually wrong. So 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 something like that. Nothing that you got egregiously wrong, which is fabulous. I think that's great. Nobody's called you out on such a factual error. And I also stay away from uh, controversial issues. So I don't talk right. about politics. I don't talk about current events. Sure. Uh, when I do, I try to, so before the, uh, the, the 2020 election, I did a series on different presidential elections throughout history. And I did one explaining the electoral Congress, uh, which kind of addressed it, but I did it in a very sort of roundabout way. I think where, the electoral college you meant, not Congress. Yeah. Electoral college. So, mm -hmm. um, so I wanted, so here's, here's how it works. Just so you know, uh, here are some other controversial elections in American history, because I think a lot of people think that what's ever happening now is the biggest thing that ever happened right. in history. It's like, <laughs> so oh, this true. is the, when I, the special is, oh, this, this election is the most important election right. in history. It's like, no, we had a thing called the civil war. It's right. going to be really hard <laughs> to top that. Right. The election of, and I haven't done one in the election of 1860 and that was probably the most important one ever. Right. And yeah. a lot of people don't realize the person who received the smallest percentage of the popular vote to ever become president, Abraham Lincoln. Hmm. Because yeah, it was know. such a contentious uh, right. you know, race. Uh, and, and there were so many different parties, uh, people running. So that was, uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that. I think people, that we have this uh, smoothed out version of history where all the rough spots are gone. And especially American history, like most Americans, like, well, we had a revolution and then nothing happened. And then the Civil War happened and then uh, some stuff out West and then World War. You know, we know the wars and maybe the mm -hmm. Great Depression and these major things and the rest of it gets forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, most people, if you ask most pe Americans, uh, name the four presidents who've been assassinated. They could right. name two. They probably can't name all four. Yeah. Uh, McKinley, uh, Lincoln, uh, God, who else? <laughs> Those are my two. <laughs> well, Kennedy, I mean, you know that. Yeah, of course, JFK, yeah. And then, uh, the fourth one, they assassinated, huh? Garfield. I oh, yeah, Gar Garfield. Okay, he was fine. president for so short that yeah, he was he like never a month. <laughs> did it. it was more than a month, but it, he didn't do much, so he's right. not really remembered. There's right. nothing. The only thing he did that was memorable was getting killed. 
Right. <laughs> the other thing that's memorable about those early deaths like McKinley is just how little security the presidents had. I think they just like walk up into a bar and shoot the president. <laughs> I actually want to do a, uh, an episode on Robert Todd Lincoln, who was the son of Abraham Lincoln, who was assassinated. He mm-hmm. was right next to Garfield when he got assassinated, and he was in the same building as McKinley when he got assassinated. Wow. It's like this guy was bad luck for presidents. <laughs> he was an assassin magnet. <laughs> Including his dad. Fascinating. Okay, last question. What have you learned from uh, over a year of podcasting? Oh, boy, a lot. Um, like, you know, I'm talking about the the art of podcasting, of like making episodes and that kind of stuff. Your, your podcast is very different than mine because you don't interview people. But there's probably something you've learned. Uh, you can't really phone it in. You know, the quality matters. I'm actually thinking, I, I've been debating it for a while, doing a, a, a small format change where once a week I would bring in a guest, but it wouldn't be for an interview. Um, what I would do is bring it, have you ever seen Part in the Interruption on ESPN? No. It's this uh, short format thing where there are two uh, uh, hosts and they just quickly go through all the sports stories of the day. It's like, LeBron James does this. Boom. They talk about it for five minutes and they just have a list on the side and they just five minutes. They just go through it and they talk about each one, uh, maybe less than five minutes. And to do something like that, where I just, you know, find a guest and it's like, okay, like if I had you on the show, it's like pick, uh, 10 episodes that you found interesting and we want to talk about. And then we just rapid style format, go through them and you either give your take on it or you say something about it or whatever. Um, and then we just go to the next one, next one, next one. It's and almost like this this talk that we're having right now. <laughs> we've been bouncing yeah, around of, all I, over the place. <laughs> uh, we, we've been, th- oh, I yeah, uh, I, I should, before I leave, Bitcoin, uh, could we talk oh. about that? Yeah, of course. I actually got my, my podcast set up to accept Bitcoin. And I think what, since I last talked to you about it, there's finally a, uh, it's getting your podcast set up to accept Bitcoin. It's called value for value. It's done by Adam Curry. Uh, they're, they're doing this whole thing called podcasting 2.0. So they're trying to add more functionality to like RSS feeds. Uh, they're creating an authoritative index that's not controlled by a big company. And then the other thing they're doing is this value for value where people can donate Satoshi's um, to a podcast. So you can either do it by the Sorry, minutes uh, you listen. S- Satoshi's for those who don't know are the smallest unit of a Bitcoin. It's a, it's a one, Hundred millionth of a Bitcoin, I believe. I want to say it's about uh, three thousand Satoshi to the dollar right now. That's right. Depending on what right. the current price is, but it's That's in right. that ballpark. That's right. Um, so you can, so you could either do it live. So if they say something you like, you could uh, give them a hundred Satoshi or whatever like that. So there had always been since the internet started this promise of micro payments, but it right. never really panned out because right? because the the overhead associated with the transaction was always the problem. Right. And this is the first real thing that seems to offer uh, frictionless, I won't say frictionless, but very low cost transactions where you can truly give money in the form of what they're the equivalent of a few cents. Right. Um, since this, uh, so there, there were two apps where you could do it. So, so setting your podcast up is easier than actually donating. On the client side, it's been harder, but there's uh, an app and I've just downloaded it. I haven't set it up yet called Fountain for iOS, and I think it's for Android, that is trying to make it an easy experience for uh, for people to actually, so you can hook it up to a wallet and then uh, do donations that way. So I think there's a thousand podcasts now that are set up to do value for value. Right, and mine is, is one of them, by the way, and, and I know yours is too. And the app I know on Android, uh, one of them is called Breeze, B-R-E-E-Z, I believe. And it's also on iOS. Um, great. And like you suggested, you can do it so that every 10 minutes or whatever you listen to that podcast, you donate a tiny fraction of a penny to the host. And so presumably if everybody did that, the host could be able to earn some decent money and it wouldn't cost the listener more than a few pennies per episode. Yeah. Uh, there's all sorts of applications for it. I think once they, they work the kinks out and, you know, I've, I've been kind of, uh, I'm, I haven't been all in on cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, but I think this usage, let's say it was just to be used online in this sort of way, where it was just the online currency. 
and maybe you just you know okay I'll 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 get twenty bucks worth I'll refill my my wallet uh, and you do that a couple times a year uh, that might be something that would be very easy for people to do that would right. be a very low cost of entry you're not talking about because I think. Th- like my mom was asking me about it. She, she sees this Bitcoin stuff on the news and, oh, it got to $50,000. And she's like, well, how can people afford these Bitcoins? Right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's like, well, you can, you can get a fractional Bitcoin, stuff like that. But I think that scares people away. Absolutely. And if it could just be used as this sort of small transactional thing for paying for stuff online, uh, you know, where you could even maybe pay for a page view for something. Because right. right now... If like there are certain, and I'm sure you've been to these sites where it's password protected or you got to get an account and you got to go through this process of signing up and you got to sign up for a, you know, a monthly, you know, you don't want to do that. But if I could just throw them a couple of Satoshis for reading this one article and it was seamless and I could just hit one button and do it, I'd do that. I think a lot of people would. Uh, There are some articles that would be worth 50 cents uh, for me to, to read. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in it, but I think that's a, that's a realistic thing. And they also created a thing called PodPing, which is one of the first – everyone's always talking, oh, the blockchain, it's going to revolutionize everything. Uh, this is the first thing I've seen that's actually real and practical where it's using the blockchain to do notifications of podcast updates. So when your podcast gets updated, it gets sent out uh, via PodPing to the, the – this blockchain system that they're using and it can, everyone can be notified within one minute. Mm. So it's a really slick way of doing it. The problem is a lot of big companies haven't adopted it yet, but it's a, it really makes a lot of sense. And uh, they're, they're doing a lot of uh, cool stuff as far as bringing podcasting forward and, and just doing stuff like expanding RSS as well, like putting in new tags. They've done a system where you can like right now with an MP3 file, you can embed images but you have to do it in the file, and it makes the file real big. They've created a system where you can do it cloud-based, where within the feed it just says, okay, at the 1 minute 90 or 52 second mark, this image appears. And I think Podcast Addict has, has adopted that. They're working on things like a transcript tag where you can actually then have the transcript for the show uh, embedded with the show itself, not just on a web page somewhere. Interesting. Yeah, I hadn't heard about that at all. By the way, uh, a lot of the listeners, they know that you and I know each other for many years. And I did learn something about you just recently that I never knew, which is you are a night owl. Well, I I, I am now, yeah. Um, <laughs> you're like, you told me you're going to bed at like five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I've always had a problem whenever I, st- when I was traveling, if I stay one place in a particularly long time, I always end up staying up later, 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 later. Right. I remember I was in Taipei once and I was like going to bed at like 5 a.m. And that's basically what I'm doing now because right. I would always stay up until I, cause I have to get the show out every day. Right. And so if it means staying up till five or four in the morning to get it done, that's, that's what, do. what I do. Right. And so, yeah, I, I got up, <laughs> I got up at like uh, one in the afternoon Wow. and that's, I, I'm not proud of it. But what? that's kind There's of nothing to be what... ashamed of. There's nothing to be but ashamed. Yeah. Of. Sometimes people who get up early are so self righteous about like getting up early as if it's more virtuous than you know somebody who stays until five o'clock. I don't. You know, it's, there's 24 hours a day. What matters is what you do during those 24 hours. But the other thing is, when you stay up really late at night working, there's no one there to bother you. Right. Which is what uh, the the early birds, the larks, say when they get up at four o'clock in the morning. They're like, there's no one there to bother you. So that's yeah. their perspective. Um, but I, I agree, whatever, whatever, whatever are the hours that you're most productive. I did hear about this one experiment. I don't know if it's true or not. Maybe you can do an episode on it, but basically they put human beings in a, in rooms without any windows and then just observed them and kept them active doing whatever they want to do. And they found out that most human beings operate on a 25 hour clock. Have you heard of this? Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard some stuff about that. It, uh, yeah. So that that could explain why you when you were in Taipei, you started going to bed later and later and later. And same, you know, is that ultimately we're all operating not all of us, but a lot of us are operating on a 25 hour clock. And so we tend to. And that's why I, I think people struggle to get up on Monday morning because Friday night they stay up a little bit later. They get up a little bit later on Saturday, they get a little bit later on Sunday. And then by the time Monday comes around, they, you know, they've it's their their sleep has been encroached on. 
I've had some trips, uh, especially one I remember I went to London where I was only going to be there for four days and I just didn't adjust my time. I just right. woke up at noon every day, <laughs> which is a normal time I would have woken up back home. <laughs> and so I never had any jet lag because I just kept my same schedule. All the appointments I had were in the afternoon or the evening. So mm. why not? <laughs> uh, and I've also been thinking of just like declaring sleep bankruptcy in one of these days, just, just don't go to bed at five and just stay up the whole next day. I'll be really super tired at work on the show and then go to bed at a, at a normal time again. And I may end yeah. up doing that at some point to kind of just reset everything. Yeah, you, you could do that. You could go to bed at 6 p.m. That would work really well during the winter up there in Wisconsin because the sun goes down so early. So 6 p.m. it's dark and you could just you could reset your clock and then get up at like two o'clock in the morning and then <laughs> go on from there. Gary, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I will um, encourage everybody to go to their podcast player and download and subscribe to your podcast, which is the Everything Everywhere Daily. Yes. Great. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for having me.